So yes, so like the talk says, I'm going to discuss plugin managers in Vim. But before I do so, I might explain like why you would want plugins in Vim in the first place. Because of course, with core Vim, you have a lot of stuff. If you were here for the first meeting, which I think maybe only Don was, um, you know, I went over a bunch of motion commands and was saying how like just how very many of them there are. There's just all sorts of built-in commands that can help you move around files really quickly, modify things in files very quickly, you know, all sorts of stuff that's built in like that. There's syntax files, which of course, when combined with Vim's auto-completion, will allow you to do auto-completion on many different languages, many different configuration files. I think I looked in my particular installation, there's about 566 different like, syntax files. Uh, Where are they? Uh, in the etc directory, I think I can't I can't remember. Which okay. directory? Like somewhere in the etc directory oh. at, at C however you say it. Uh, um, and as Dawn discussed in her talk last time, there's a lot of different Vim configuration you can do. So you can change things around to sort of make Vim into a, almost like a completely different editor for you than it is for many other people. Uh, and there's actually, uh, I don't know if many people have tried to change this, but if you like different color schemes, uh, for instance, if you like a dark color scheme versus a light color scheme, uh, also by default it has about 15 or so different color schemes that you can set that are just built in. And you know, that's just sort of the surface level of stuff that Vim has. I mean, there's all sorts of different uh, things that you can have. Uh, and like years after years, been, I've been using Vim. I've been using Vim for years, and I'm still uh, finding stuff out about. It. So of course, it's very powerful, and you might think, well, why do we need to do anything at all to extend it? So I figured I'd just sort of go through a couple of examples of things that I do from time to time that Vim doesn't actually do very well by default, just out of the box. So this. Right here would be some idiomatic Perl, or technically this is also valid Ruby. Um, I'm not sure if it's valid in many other languages. But basically it's a one-liner that says like, you know, do something if some other condition is met. But what I often find is that I write a line like this, and then I'm like, well, I'm not sure if something is actually happening, so I need to add some debugging, so I have to turn it into a multi-line function, like, or a multi-line statement like this. So if I did like a little bit of Vim golf and tried to do it as efficiently as I could, I couldn't figure out a way to do this in any shorter than these 24 different keystrokes. And this is, of course, an idealized situation where I started at the best possible character that I could, sat there and thought really hard about it, about what possibly I could do to do this in the fewest possible keystrokes, and then actually did that. Um, and of course, if you switch it around, it's actually not that much more efficient either. If I finally verified that everything worked and I wanted to turn it back into a single line statement because it looks prettier that way, it's still about 23 keys. In fact, it's these 23 keys. So, you know, it's not that fast at doing that in spite of how, uh, how powerful Vim is. I mean, you see, I didn't actually have to retype anything. I just moved text around. But there is a plugin that does this very well. And it actually takes, it, takes both of those operations down to three keystrokes. So it's just G and a capital S, and I'm, I'm counting shift as a keystroke. Um, it's shift, G shift S to split lines out into a multi-line statement, and G shift J to join them back into a one single line statement. And actually, it's not just Perl and Ruby data structures like this. It'll do the same thing for JavaScript arrays. It has a whole bunch of things that it understands by default. It understands uh, HTML tags. So if you've got like a, a nested HTML tag, it will actually split it out into uh, separate lines and join it back together really intelligently. So this is a pretty cool uh, plugin. And here's another example of something that is kind of um, not as efficient as it could be in Vim, even though it seems like maybe it's something that it would do. And that's if you've got, for instance, plain text here, that then you go and you add a variable to. 
Well, of course, if you actually, in most cases, what you actually want is you want the value of that dollar text in there, but with most languages, the single quotes mean don't interpret it, double quotes mean do interpret it. So you have to go and replace it then with double quotes around either side. And that doesn't seem like a true terrifically complicated uh, operation, but again, in an idealized case where your cursor starts here or here, you, you can't really do this, as far as I can tell, in anything less than six keys. And that's just replacing the character moving forward to the next apostrophe and repeating the operation. So, and that's, again, the ideal case. Most times, you know, your cursor will be somewhere else. So there's another plugin called Vim Surround, which actually will allow you to change the surrounding uh, quotes um, if you need to add surrounding quotes or add surrounding parentheses or any other uh, enclosing elements. Uh, that would actually take it take that particular operation, and it's not as stark, it's not like 23 to 3, but it's five keys, and that's, you know, in any particular case, your cursor can be anywhere inside of that string, and you can just change it. So this is just a couple of plugins that sort of make things better. So even though Core Vim is very powerful, you know, you can find plugins that add lots of mappings to make things you know, even better, uh, like add more more text manipulations, more ways to jump around the file. Um, there are custom languages that have definitions. I think you mentioned earlier you added some Haskell support into Vim. Um, and also it used to be that Markdown wasn't particularly well supported. I believe Tim Pope added some stuff into Vim 7.2, I want to say. So that's built in. But like a language I use to write music notation, Lily Pond is not supported by default. So you know, that sort of thing can be uh, added in. There are some people who write entire configurations for Vim. So if you see somebody has their uh, setup very nice or whatever, they might actually uh, wrap their entire configuration into, uh, into a plugin that then you can just sort of add with one easy command. And there's a whole website that lists about like a thousand uh, Vim color schemes, if 16 aren't enough for you. Um, and I'm sure there's many other places. And again, that's just sort of the surface level of what Vim, what these plugins can do. There's actually all sorts of additional things where it can, uh, for instance, it can run commands in the background and then report back to you and put some results into your file, that sort of thing. Make it really easy. So, you know, I think we should be able to agree that plugins are pretty awesome. But if you just looked at one of the links I sent earlier that I listed earlier in the file, this is the GitHub page for the split join plugin. So if you're just looking at this, you're sitting there thinking, well, that's a lot of files. I don't know where to put them. I don't know which of these files I need because, you know, I probably don't need this contributing file or the readme or whatever. And if you really got right down to it, as far as I can tell, you only really need these three directories worth of code to actually make it work. Uh, although you probably, for you know, informational purposes, you want the documentation as well. But you know, you still have to download them, know where to put them, uh, how, to, how to load them into your into Vim after you download them. So of course, you don't necessarily want to spend more time putting this crap on your computer then you're actually theoretically saving by using it. So, you know, you don't want to like spend hours and hours automating a task that you could have done by hand in three minutes. <laughs> yeah. So that's where these plugin managers, you know, come in and help. So there's going to be four of them I'm going to talk about today. There are more plugin managers that are out there, but I think these are the four most popular ones based on what I was able to find when I was going and researching like what plugin managers people use. Um, so first off, the most simple one, um, like simple as in straightforward, not uh, simple as in like uh, um, unvaluable. Uh, That's sick. What's that? Pathogen? Ha <laughs> 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 uh, So yes, Vim Pathogen is uh, a fairly simple and straightforward plugin manager. 
Uh, Vundal is one that um, is the one that I use. Uh, it's a little bit less straightforward, um, but you know it does a bit more things for you. Uh, there's Vim Add-on Manager, which is pretty uh, complex. There's a lot you can do with it, but you know it's got a lot of um, a bit of a learning curve, much more than the others. And Neo Bundle, which is kind of trying to, um, shall we say, be Bundle plus <laughs> plus. So, the first one is Vim Pathogen, which is by Tim Pope, who is a guy who writes some of the best plugins that I've found. Uh, he's really smart, especially with Vim, but I mean in general. So, I mean, you know, pedigree wise, this particular manager has a lot going for it. But the one thing that it isn't necessarily good for everybody is that it's very minimal. It assumes that you know at least how to download and install or download plugins and where to put them. Because, or at least put them all in the same spot. So, you know, you say, uh, this is my plugins directory and I'm going to download all the ones I want and manage updating them and everything else. Um, so it actually just goes wherever you say your plugin directory is and says, okay, load all the plugins in here. And it assumes that every plugin that's in there is one you want unless you specifically say otherwise. But uh, it is, uh, if you don't necessarily care for the basic level of operations that it provides for you, uh, there are some hooks inside of it. And Tim Pope's pretty good about writing documentation, writing fairly readable code. So you know, if you're if you're comfortable with it, then you know you can sort of expand upon what it does. So installing it's pretty straightforward, uh, except for the fact that maybe this doesn't look as straightforward because it's a very long command, but it is just one command to sort of download the uh, pathogen script. This is from the pathogen documentation itself. Um, so I just sort of copy and paste it. That's what I would generally do if I were going to install it on a new machine. Um, I wouldn't necessarily try to remember this. <laughs> um, so that just puts one script in one specific spot that Vim will automatically load. So you see this Vim auto load directory. That's where you would put some script that Vim will automatically search for, um, for scripts to run. And the scripts that will run is actually this, uh, when you call this execute pathogen infect, which is, again, sick. Um, that will actually call the, the pathogen.vim file and it will look for the infect method and set everything up that it needs to set up to, uh, to load your plugins. What does the file type plugin intent on do? Um, I believe that uh, there's, there's um, other directories that it searches for things, so the file type plugin indent uh, on, that just basically turns on the file type detection and, um, and looks for, uh, turns on the file type detection. There's also, in addition to syntax files, there are indent files so that it knows how to like, go back and forth when you have like, the smart tab turned on and everything like that. Um, so this is just so that, you know, this makes sure that it looks through the full set of directories uh, and not just the autoload directory. And the syntax on is just so you get all the pretty highlighting, especially if you're installing a plugin that adds highlighting. Um, I, think it, I think that, in fact, method might also call some other things like, you know, setting the no compatible mode as well because most of the plugins require that. So as I said earlier, this actually expects you to know how to do like a git clone into a specific directory or however you want to uh, move those, um, get those plugins in place. Um, it, it expects you to know how to put them in the directory that you specified. By default, it's .vim slash bundle. But when you call in that infect method, I believe you can pass it a directory to, to load. I have a question. Um, if you do git clone into a directory that already is part of another project that uses git, 
does that cause problems? I think Git will refuse to clone into a directory that already exists and has stuff in it. I think it will clone into an empty directory, but if it already has, um, if it already has something in that directory, then it then it won't. Uh, it will refuse to continue. Um, no, I mean, like a, let's say I have a project and it uses Git, and then I create a folder and put and do Git clone into that folder. The folder is empty, but it's a level below in the tree of the Git. Um, you can do that. Uh, what well, this actually sort of folds into this because I wasn't going to mention it, but I, <laughs> since since you asked. Um, the way he, I believe that Tim Pope himself uses this in particular is he does something similar to that. Uh, you can use what's called git submodules to, um, to sort of track another git repository inside of your main git repository. I'm not a particular fan of doing that, but basically it allows you to say, okay, uh, I'm cloning this repository from this source at this particular revision. Um, and so that way, when when he goes to, for instance, clone his Vim setup somewhere, he clones the main repository, and then for all of these plugins, he just uh, I believe it's a git sub module in it and git sub module update, which will pull down all of those plugins for him because it's just like each directory is a git repository, and it's just a reference. So it says, okay, go pull this git repository and set it at this revision. Go pull this git repository and set it at this revision. So again, some modules are kind of an advanced, uh, relatively advanced Git topic, I suppose, intermediate to advanced. Um, but he he assumes that you are intelligent enough to manage these sorts of things on your own. And for instance, if you wanted to, if you're not doing the sub module thing, and you wanted to update it, you might actually be able to go and update all your plugins with a nice little script like this, which you know kind of a pain to write, but I mean, you have to be very intentional about the versions of the plugins that you want. You're not, it doesn't go through and update your plugins for you or download and install them for you. It just finds them for you and makes sure that they're loaded. So the one I use the bundle, uh, I actually don't know what this guy's real name is. Uh, actually, I don't even know for sure if it's a guy. I think so. Um, because I wasn't able to find it online, I kind of feel like it's like the, the, the Y or whatever. He just doesn't want, doesn't publish his name. Um, but even though he, he's the main author, uh, it's currently under a change, uh, under a bit of a change in ownership. Uh, he's sort of swamped because it's pretty popular. He's not handling all of the uh, pull re uh, issues requests and everything like that. So he's trying to find other people to take over for the project. If that sort of turns you off of something that, you know, there's a bit of uneasiness about its future, then, you know, might not be the one for you. But it's fairly similarly small in terms of configuring it um, and available configuration as, um, as pathogen. Uh, you do actually have to do a bit of configuration per plugin, which you don't, which you didn't have to do with pathogen. But it doesn't have much because all it really will do is install and update, and then, like periodically, if you remove a plugin, it will it will clean that plugin out for you. Um, but it doesn't really do much other than that. It doesn't it doesn't uh, have all of the features of say the Vim add-on manager or the Vim level. But uh, for my particular purposes, just being able to say these are the plugins I want, please install them. That's good for me. So when you say install them, it's not install them into Vim as it's running. It's install them on your computer so that they'll be there for Vim. Yeah, you would have to. Uh, I think you would have to. I'm not sure how you would reload them. I usually just install them and then exit and restart Vim. Uh, so that I mean, I'm sure you can add them in, uh, but I don't. I don't know if there's a. Uh, I don't think there's a built-in command to do that in the bundle, at least. So installing this, uh, again, you would, have, you would ideally use Git to do this. Um, it, it works a lot around Git. I mean, 
That's its primary method of operation, is get repositories. And then in the MRC, you see, and I mentioned set no compatible earlier, you have to set this for bundle to work. Um, and it all, Pathogen probably set this as well before it started doing what it needed to do. Um, here you're actually telling it, okay, here's where you can find bundle and you call begin to say, I'm about to start configuring my plugins. Once you're done configuring your plugins, you say end and it'll actually go through and set them up to be loaded. And so managing plugins themselves. Can you go back to that one for a second? Yeah. Because I have, I'm using Bundle, but I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so. Now, it did go through, I think the, it didn't formerly need the end call. Like I don't think I have that. What's that? I don't think I have that. Yeah, so it's probably just an older version of Bundle. Yeah. And I still don't think it's required right now, but I think it's better to have it. I think it just. Um, I still in its GitHub file. Mm. So I'm looking at the GitHub repository of that wonder, mm -hmm. and in the quick start, uh, they have a list of commands, and they still have call wonder, and. No, I'm. I, well, yeah. What I'm saying is, that it, like, it used to just be, uh, uh, like, you would call one command to set it up instead mm -hmm. of the begin and end commands. I, I'm not sure if it used to be called begin. I might have been start or something. But yeah, so that's just now because of how it works. I think this allows it to start up a little bit faster because you can say, okay, I'm starting, load all the plugins, and then now I'm finished. And go do some additional work rather than trying to go through it and uh, changing things as it's going, as it finds these next commands, which as I was about to say. Um, so when you say the call begin and end, in between you have all these plugin declarations, which you just say, you know, plugin and then the name of the plugin. And in this particular case, uh, Vundle actually is, like I said, it, like, it, it works primarily around Git and in particular GitHub. So these are both GitHub repositories. When it sees a simple declaration like this, it just assumes, oh, I need to go look on GitHub for this. Is, is it possible that the plugin command used to be named bundle. Uh, it used to be called bundle, yeah. Okay, um, thanks. The, and I have a really old one. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I forget when exactly it changed, but ideally, they. I mean, well, you can actually update bundle with this plugin uh, bundle update, and so these commands could also be run as bundle install bundle up. Uh, uh. So I just do that from the command line of BIM that will update my... It will update any plugins. Bundle. Oh, all the plugins. Yeah. So that's that's what I was about to say is uh, this plugin install and uh, will just install missing plugins. So if I have this one but I just added this one, when I say plugin install, it'll say, oh, you already got this, but I'll go fetch that one. If I run plugin install with an exclamation point, it'll actually also do an update on everything as well. So it'll find any that I specify that are missing, as well as pulling down any updates. If I just want to do the updates but don't want to find the missing ones, I just call plugin update. And if I say remove the vim surround command, the vim surround plugin, uh, if I say plugin clean, it'll actually go through and delete that. Um, And because, and the way I tend to do this um, is I do this uh, vim plus plugin install with an exclamation point that actually runs, starts up vim and immediately runs the plugin install command with the updates attached. I actually have um, effectively a cron job that goes through and does that every so often. A lot of people don't like automatically updating plugins, in particular because you see if you go through and have these uh, if they hadn't just deprecated the bundle command, like in theory, you can still use right. bundle for all of these things. But if they had just taken it out, then your entire vimrc file would break. Right. So some people don't necessarily like to automatically update plugins because not every single plugin manager or every pl single plugin maintainer is a good steward of not breaking everybody's everything right. with any given update. So I'm fairly confident in 
my ability to roll back to previous versions of plugins if they break things. So I don't mind doing that automatic install and update. But one thing that's kind of a bummer is, as, um, as I mentioned earlier, this actually just updates all of them. It just goes through and wholesale updates everything. It is, uh, it's all or nothing. Like there's no, just update this one plugin, please. You'd have to go and do that manually. So, but that's where something more advanced like the Vim add-on manager comes in. Um, this is by a guy named Mark Weber. It's got a lot more configuration you can do. Um, it requires a lot more understanding of what's going on, but it also has a lot more power to it as a result. When you specify plugins, it will actually go through and try to automatically install them in most cases. Uh, so, you know, there's no specify this, um, there is a way to say specify this plugin and then later install it. But generally speaking, when you specify a plugin, it just, as soon as you load your VimRC file, it's like, oh, I don't have this plugin, let me go get it. But on the other hand, it also has uh, the ability to lazy load plugins, which means like, if you have, for instance, a collection of plugins that all work on Perl files, and a collection of plugins that all work on Ruby files, and a collection of plugins that all work on Haskell files, PHP files, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you've got like 150 plugins, if you tried to load all of those plugins every time you open Vim, it would just take a while to load. So maybe you only want to load the Perl plugins when you're opening a Perl file. So this actually, with a bit more configuration, allows you to specify, okay, only load these plugins when I'm editing this kind of file, or just you can group them together and tag them, say, okay, these are um, my web editing uh, plugins, so please load, like you can say, load tag, uh, load plugin tag when on, on a particular situation. And whereas um, Bundle only primarily or only really supported Git, uh, Vim Add-on Manager actually supports a whole array of them. It supports Subversion, Bazaar, Mercurial, obviously Git. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of cool as well, because I guess it sort of opens the door for more plugins that you can use. Um, installing Vim Add-on Manager is fairly similar to installing Bundle, um, except instead of going into the slash bundle directory, it goes into the Vim Add-ons directory. That's where it tends to look for its plugins, because it actually doesn't call them plugins or bundles. It calls them add-ons, obviously. Even add on manager calls them add ons. And then to, um, to start up the Vim add on manager, once again, you set the no compatible, you turn the, the file type plugin and invent on, the syntax on, all that stuff. And then you tell this RTP variable, which you might have seen that before with the bundle, um, that's just the uh, runtime path variable, that's where Vim starts to look for things, and that's what all these plugin managers tend to manipulate. So you just do it once, and then the, plug, the plugin manager takes over and manages the rest of it for you. And then this method, you're not, it's not actually doing much of anything at this point, but it actually gives you, it, it loads the Vim add-on manager script for you, so that all the commands that are defined in it are made available for you. So those commands, the primary one I would Use so you saw the back to this uh, Vim activate command, and you can specify plugins that you want. Um, again, because this is, uh, and I'm, I'm unfortunately a little less confident about the the, pro the correct spec for uh, the plugin syntax. But again, because this supports multiple. Um, version control systems, it's not necessarily specific. Uh, it's not going to guess that you mean a Git repository or a GitHub repository. Maybe you mean a Bitbucket repository or something like that. So you would have to specify the kind of um, repository you're expecting this plugin to live. And I guess GitHub is considered a big enough fish in the ponds that you know you can just have it on the top level. So I said earlier that uh, it automatically installs add-ons, except, of course, 
if you've got a line like this. So you can actually specify in your configuration before you call this activate add-ons um, so that before the script loads, um, you can actually specify a set of options for how it should behave. And one in particular you might want, if you don't want, if you say, for instance, um, don't want to automatically install every plugin that you specify, you want to say, okay, I'm putting this in my VimRC Evo, I, I'll install it later, because maybe you don't have internet right now, but you saw it in a talk and you just want to add it right now. Um, if you did that and then you opened Vim again, it would complain at you that it couldn't get any internet connection. So this will allow you to turn that off so that then you can go back later and say, okay, install this add-on in particular. But of course, in most cases, I would probably leave it off just because um, one of the cool things about this is how automatic things can be. Um, and to update any, this is another thing that it has that Bundle doesn't, is it allows you to update one particular add-on instead of all of them. Or actually, it, if you don't give it a plug it, an add-on to install, then, you know, uh, It'll actually ask you, are you sure? Did you actually mean to leave the, the argument off? And if you say yes, please update all of my plugins, it will actually go through and update all of them. And there's a lot more configuration you can do. Um, this would, uh, I saw that I mentioned earlier, the auto install variable. This is another, um, you can actually call this method instead of vim activate. You can just keep calling this with different uh, with different add-on names, and you can actually provide arguments to it to change how it installs them. I believe it, um, you might be able to specify like specific revisions or versions of plugins. And in theory, I think this one also supports the idea of sort of dependencies. I don't think most of the others tend to do that. So if you know your plugin relies on another, pl a plugin you want relies on another plugin, and it can specify that, and this will actually go through. Even though you said you only wanted the top level plugin, it will actually install any dependent plugins, which is kind of cool, but I don't know how many uh, Vim plugins are actually structured in that way. It's maybe something it's just trying to, you know, trying to get everybody on board with. So, and NeoBundle, is, like I said earlier, is kind of like the um, bundle plus plus. Um, it's self-described as a uh, next generation um, plugin manager. And what that means is it takes advantage if you have an additional uh, extension installed. It can do updates in the background. Like normally Vim is actually a single threaded thing. So if you give it a command to run, you have to wait for that command to finish because it only runs one thread at a time. Unless you've got this extension which allows it to have operate in the background, which if you have, for instance, plugins that require compiled uh, external components, then um, maybe that takes a while to build. Or maybe you're downloading a bunch and you're on a slow connection or something. And you don't necessarily want to stop what you're doing and wait for this plugin installer to run you want to keep on getting on with your work. So this allows you to do that. It definitely, I'm sure, uh, whereas I was confused with the Vim add-on manager, this will actually definitely allow you to say, I want this specific version of this specific plugin. Like you don't say you know that your, your system will break if you update this one particular plugin, but you want all the other ones to stay up to date. You can specify with that particular plugin, I only want this exact version. Don't ever update this one. And it will allow you to do that. I have a question. If, if you're running an update on, if you ran Vim and you're doing an update and it stopped your work, can you open another terminal window and run Vim there? Or yeah. And edit I the mean, same files? Or? I mean, there, well, when you're... You edit the same file, because I'm the swap file. Yeah, I mean you can you can you can disable that, but generally you don't want to edit the same files in two locations. Well, you could quit the files that you were working. I mean, you could yeah, just you open you a you separate vim just for running the installations. So yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, you could do that. I mean, that was that was sort of a a hackneyed example, I'll admit. But you know, 
it's it's still just kind of cool to be able to you know have things like printing in the background uh, because you can also periodically I think have it to where it just periodically uh, kicks off this update process like some people just leave their Vim session open forever or something like that but they do periodically want stuff to update so you know this would allow them to do that and I believe I didn't list it in here Oh, I also mentioned this update cache. So theoretically, you tell it to update. It actually, I believe, retains the last time any given uh, plugin was updated. So if you run update all of them, it won't necessarily try to update every single one every single time, uh, unless I think you override that. And I was about to say something else. Um, the I'm sure it'll come back to me in a second. Um, in addition, it also supports multiple version control systems. I don't know if it supports as many version control systems as the Vim add-on manager does, but it does support at least subversion in addition, um, and maybe others. So the NeoBundle installation will be pretty similar to the Bundle installation because it is trying to be, it basically took a lot from Bundle. So it's just cloning into, instead of bundle.bim, it's cloning into neobundle.bim, and instead of cloning from And um, yeah, it's got the begin and end here, like from bundle. These two lines are both, should be pretty uh, familiar by now. And one thing that's different is that it has this uh, neobundle, like instead of plugin or bundle, it's a new bundle as the prefix for all its commands. Um, so it also has a few additional commands like this new bundle fetch, which theoretically registers it as a plugin that it's tracking, but it doesn't necessarily try to load the code. The reason it doesn't try to load the code is because it actually already loaded it here in these two lines. So it's just tracking this so that you can, for instance, use new bundle to update itself. Um, and then this Neo Bundle check line is also new. This actually automatically checks for any non installed plugins. And instead of trying to install them automatically, it just says, Oh, I see you have some plugins that are listed but missing. Do you want me to go ahead and try to install those now? And uh, adding plugins, very similar to um, Bundle again. Uh, instead of bundle or plugin, like I mentioned, it's just Neo Bundle. And very similarly, it also supports the short syntax for GitHub based plugin repositories. And to install, you again might be familiar with these commands. And they basically do the same thing. The install, which just installs missing plugins, the install with an exclamation point, which installs and updates, uh, the update which just updates, and the clean, which of course was everything. And because it's, you know, features that, you can also update things that way. So in short, Vim uh, has all these plugin managers, but Pathogen is, you know, simple, quick, and easy. If you're really comfortable and confident with managing your own versioning and installation of plugins, then this is good because it allows you to just sort of download them into one specific repository and it automatically loads them. You don't ever have to change your VimRC just to, just to get a new plugin installed. Um, bundle is pretty straightforward if you don't mind the sort of uh, gutsy all or nothing way it does things. Uh, it's still pretty simple and straightforward to install and use it. So, you know, it's it's pretty handy and that's why I particularly like it. The Vim add-on manager has tons and tons of options, uh, really quite configurable, probably the most uh, configurable of all of them. And Neo Bundle, which has, I think, some very neat features uh, that make it kind of like Bundle, but, you know, a, a little bit more powerful if Bundle is kind of not, you know, it's not granular enough control for you. So, so that's all I got. Anybody have any questions?
questions? That was good. Great. Yeah. I have all this bundle stuff in my that VimRC. I had no idea what any of it did. <laughs> I just I wanted uh, Nerd Tree, and I managed to install it without knowing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know what any of these comments meant, and now I do. Even though they all say bundle instead of plugin. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, it's definitely a, it's handy to know what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, they all say like you know, oh, set these three variables, right. and it'll all be great, and it's like, well, why? <laughs> you know, but. And it also looks like I have um, Pathogen as well, although I don't see where it ever got installed. That's interesting. But I've got a Pathogen command in here, Pathogen Infect, um, and it appears to work. Huh. Well, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I, what I was going to say, I don't know if they, how well they all work together. Like, if, I mean, they, by and large, just uh, manipulate the runtime path. So I don't know if they'll necessarily make anything blow up if you try and use them together, but I personally probably wouldn't. Do you want to take a glance at this when you're done? I'm not sure. It's really bad. I mean, if it's not breaking anything. Then it's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, the Haskell stuff comes in from Pathogen, and uh, Nerd Tree comes in from Bundle. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can see how that, I mean, those two are pretty straight, pretty simple. Uh, and what they do, like I said, they're yeah. they're not trying to do too much, so I can see that they wouldn't necessarily conflict. Um, and I might have skipped it on the pathogen one, but theoretically you can actually have it manage multiple, like add multiple directories instead of just the one directory. You can actually pass a list of directories. So what he, like I mean, Tim Pope is, as I mentioned, a, a pretty prolific plugin off author himself, but he doesn't necessarily push up to GitHub to pull down his uh, projects or whatever. He works on them in his working directory and then has you know his main directory where he keeps his uh, plugins that other people have written. So he kind of keeps them separated, but he uses Pathogen to manage both of them. So you know that might be handy. And you know obviously because it doesn't try to do too much with the directory, that's probably why. Uh, well, it also looks like. So I didn't know what I was doing the Vim HDEV tools, which is the Haskell things, wound up in the bundle directory. And since the only art, um, only thing, the only runtime path thing includes that, the only setting to RTP in my <coughs> file is to that directory. So right. when it said execute pathogen infect, it apparently went there and found it. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, it's kind of like the path variable in the shell. Right. I mean, if you just add the same path onto it multiple times, it's not going to break anything. No, I only added it once. I didn't add one for pathogen. Oh. And so the pathogen one already saw that one for bundle and went there. I think. <laughs> That's <Okay>. intelligent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's following orders. <laughs> or the order of the RT. <laughs> Are these plugins written in C language? Not most of them. Most of them are just written in Vim script. Uh, there are some with extensions. Like I mentioned, there are some that have to be compiled. Like the like the extension that allows Vim to run things in the background. That one probably has some C code in it because it's like a sort of a deeper extension. Is, is Vim script this? Because I remember someone told me once that no. uh, Vim is, or VI is written in this. No, mm -hmm. it's Emacs. Yeah, Emacs is the Emacs oh, okay. is the Lisp editor. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure you can edit Lisp in Vim, but I guess uh, I think if you're if you're a big Lisp fan, I think you you tend to be also a big Emacs fan more than Vim. You do or you don't? I do. I, I think that if you're if you're big into Lisp, I mean. Oh, um, Lisp. I've been trying, I've been forcing myself to use Emacs lately, and I'm, you know, like a bare beginner on it. Right. And I keep missing things that I know how to do in BI. Yeah. Um, and I like, for example, the dot command. Okay, so I went online to see if there was an equivalent in the Emacs, and there doesn't seem to be. Oh. I, how you live without that, I don't know. But uh, uh, you know, there are other advantages, apparently. It's surprising I don't actually use the dot command all that often. Really? I use it all the time. 
Um, I have to leave because I have to drive to Delaware. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're actually out of time. So I want. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Or um, do you use Emacs at all? I don't. Okay. I, I mean, I would. I I've been looking for somebody to try. I, I've been trying to get somebody who's familiar with Emacs to get to talk here about how to use Emacs. If well, I can tell you basic commands, but they're really basic. If I mean, that's. I never use it. Uh, iPhone is a little more fancy than Win. Um, lots of commands going here and there, and you have to understand it first. It doesn't okay. have an insert mode. Mm. So Vim can use the same letters for two things. You, know, you can type with them, and you can do certain right. things in certain control sequences in insert mode, but mostly you do it in um, command mode. It also doesn't have any command line mode, so the all the extra keys you have to use get really crazy. Mm. You have to use what they call the meta key and the control key, and there's a couple of other keys, and it's a real pain to set up your meta key. Cause right, cause so that's a, right. what is it, a sun thing? Yeah, well, I mean, the original, I think the Emacs mouse had five buttons. But uh, definitely three. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. So, yeah, like I was saying, I think we're actually out of time. So. Yeah, that was really good. Can, can I have?